Welcome Joe or anyone else who's watching this video from the link in the SharpCap forum. I'm going to run through a very easy workflow to get very good results from using the live stack. And it's going to cover a couple of things. One is the before stacking things that you have to look at. And that's it. Close all of your menu items in SharpCap because you don't need them except for the one which controls the camera. And within that is exposure and gain. And down at the bottom of the menu is something called the display histogram. Why I've written this big reset in capitals I'll explain to you during the demonstration that I show you, the live demo of stacking. But within this histogram, the reason why these three things work so well together is there's a signal that the histogram gives with the shape of the white curve that's in the histogram. And when that signal is met by a combination of gain and exposure, the images are fine and the best, in my opinion, to start stacking. Then I'm just going to cover the few main options within live stacking that you're going to need to look at. And it's these. Once you get into stacking, the first thing you should do is find the tab with the histogram. Don't worry about any of the others. Just reset it. And then when you start stacking, after about the second frame gets in or whatever, you'll see that the align checkbox becomes alive. Make sure you check that. Then just occasionally look at and watch when the frames are being stacked. And after you get an amount, say four or five or six frames, you can start to do what I call histogram art, which is where you move the sliders around. And there's really not many adjustments you have to do. But stressing here, I'm not going to talk about what each of these individual things actually do. I'm going to talk about workflow. Because often you can read these manuals or someone will tell you on the web about how a particular tool works, but they don't tell you when to move them and why you should move them or if you should move them. So this is what this is about. It's using those few very rudimentary controls that I just showed you on that uh, checklist as a workflow. Okay, so let's crack on. I'll just minimize this for a second and start up sharp cap where I've got my ZWO ASI224 camera installed and ready to go now unfortunately um, by the way I'm using sharp cap 3.2 for a very good reason and it is because outside for the last three days has been pouring with rain and wind we have a cyclone which is like a hurricane in the northern hemisphere off the coast and um, it's just been terrible weather and I'm still doing a live demo though for you and it's the reason why I'm using the pro version I've paid for the pro version of SharpCap because of this option right here folder monitor camera and this is very good for beginners because about a month ago when I was out doing some imaging doing some EAA Part of what I did was I clicked an option in SharpCap to save all of the individual images as it was stacking. I didn't just save the final nicely stacked image, I saved all of the images that were stacking. And the reason is the next day I copied those off, and I often do this, I copy those images off to a folder and I keep them to muck around with whenever I like because you can drop those saved images, the individual frames that you shot during the night and you can paste them into this monitored folder that SharpCat monitors and you can replay them and stack them in the day, the night, no matter what the weather and just practice your, your uh, hobby. Practice how to use all of these many control panel options and so forth which aren't showing because I haven't connected the camera yet, but you know what I mean. So let me just do that quickly. Here's my ZWA camera. Okay. I've set up, because it's such atrocious weather outside, I've set up just pointing at my TV just to get you going, as if we were focusing the camera for the first time out in the dark. So let me unpin the thing here, so the auto hide isn't on. Now, all I've done here is I've minimized 
every menu option here except for the one or two that contain what we need. Camera controls contains exposure and gain and I've made sure that auto is not set. Do not use auto in the dark because it hunts in exposure and hunts in gain trying to get some image on the screen and I've always found it very flaky. I personally always use this in manual mode. None of the rest of this stuff matters for the purposes of getting a good image except down here I've got the display histogram showing and uh, straight away I will reset it for no other reason than that's what I always do and I'll explain the reasons why I always use that in reset mode and I'll explain that when I actually get to the stacking demo okay but for now the reason I want to show you about focusing is the following. Many people try to throw the camera on straight away in the dark and they can't find focus and or when they are trying to do their star alignments they find that it's extremely difficult as well. So my recommendation for a beginner is always to use your eyepiece to do your star alignments and then once you've done your alignments do a go to the brightest star in your location in your sky and center it using the hand control because once you've centered it in your eyepiece and then put the camera in you know that the star will be sort of centered in the view of the camera you're not going to have to insert the camera and be looking at very faint stars where it's hard to focus. By using the eyepiece for your star alignments and to go to the brightest star in your location and center it, when you put the camera in, it's got to be in the field of view of the camera. You may, however, and let me just go over here and drop the gain so you can't see anything. Oh, I just see what's going on here. Make sure too, in the dark, you've got long exposure checked and you're using down the extreme left here of the curve, which is about, there we go, a half a second. Because when you first um, try to focus, you insert the camera, you should see that really bright star centered or roughly centered that you went to, used the go to. The first thing you should do is maximize the gain and you will definitely get to see the star. At that point you do your focus and I'm not going to bore you with that because I'm sure you know how to focus. But it also serves the purpose of introducing you to the next thing is should you not be able to see the star even at maximum gain then usually you grab this slider or these drop downs and go to the next highest setting. So that's half a second showing at the moment. So let's go to one second. And it takes a shot and brings up a brighter image. So you should be able to focus. But more importantly now, you can see down on this histogram, here's this signal that you can see that helps you identify when you've got a shot that's ready to stack. It is nothing more than the white curve that's on this histogram. Don't bother with any of the other curves, just look at this white curve. And you can see that the very left hand edge of that curve intersects with the vertical axis. It shouldn't. To get the best amount of detail and signal, they call it, that white curve should start just just off the vertical axis but start from the horizontal axis and you can see it doesn't so the way I'm going to do is when you go to your first target it should be one of maybe a half a dozen of the brightest nebulas or brightest globulars biggest and brightest nebulas biggest and brightest globulars in your location because the bigger and brighter they are, the more likely you are to find them, even if your go-to isn't totally accurate. At high gain, you'll get a glimpse of the edge of one of them, whatever, 
and soon know which direction to go. Okay? But secondly, your job is not to go out there as a beginner and hunt down faint galaxies on tiny little targets or go to random stuff which you have no idea if you've landed on or not because you don't really know what they look like. Your job as a beginner is to go to those half a dozen big bright nebs and big bright globulars purely so you can practice this craft of working out about all the sliders. Because when you're at this maximum gain, I'm going to explain these two controls here, exposure and, and gain. You can see here that I need to get that peak away or the whole curve away so that that line can intersect down here. The way you do that is because you're at maximum gain, there's only one control to change. Remember, we're only looking at exposure and gain. So we have to increase exposure. So let's try two seconds and watch the histogram come in. Well, yeah, it's probably good enough to go. It's right down at this point just above the mouse. The next thing to look for when that happens and hits that point is where does the right hand of the curve hit? And it really doesn't. It, the, this, by the way, this version of SharpCap always seems to go berserk at this far end here. But I can see it, it's not intersecting kind of around this region here where I'm waving the mouse. That 50 percentile, it should hit somewhere kind of like just past that point. And it's not. That means gain is too high. So let's drop the gain back. Now, the reason why it's important that we get uh, that gain back is look at this mottled effect. That is noise. Stacking does get rid of the noise. But if you start with a very noisy image, you're going to have to stack a lot more to get rid of the noise. So it, it's in your best interest to drop this noise as much as you can. So let's drop the noise now. We'll go back kind of like one slider width and wait for the image to come in. Nope, it's still too far to the right. So we'll drop it another slider width to the left. Wait for the image to come in. Oh, just about right. But this curve is no longer intersecting right in that corner. So we probably have to go to like maybe three seconds. There we go. Wait for the image to come in. Looks good. But again now, a little bit too far to the right. Let's drop gain another notch. Or another slider width. Probably too much. It should intersect just a bit past there. So let's go just a half a slider width. And see what we get. Wait for it to come in. That looks fine. It's just intersecting down on the corner there and just intersecting past there. For the purposes of this, we're right to go. But here's the thing. You saw that juggling act I just did here. And sure enough, we've got much less noise going on now. And even at three seconds, we would actually be able to start stacking at this point. But the idea is, with the six biggest, brightest globs and six biggest and brightest nebs, is for you to actually do exactly like I just did and start stacking and using the techniques I'm about to show you in stacking. But after you finish stacking that first object you went to, whatever it is, I would then get you to change these settings like this. You'd say to yourself, righto, I'm now going to try and drop the gain again and go for whatever's twice that. So let's try six seconds. Four, five, whoop. That'll do, 5.9 seconds. Wait for the image to come in. You can see it's off the left hand edge, but we've got to get this right head edge back. How? By dropping the gain. So you can see what I'm doing is I'm teaching you how to reduce the gain and still at low seconds worth of shots, get the image ready in this correct signal position to start stacking with even more, with even less noise. 
the idea being that you shoot first of all as we did earlier three seconds with a high again give it a go at that very short but noisy uh, setting and see how you go stacking learn how to control and how long you have to wait but stay on that same ob object and double the exposure time and reduce the gain so once again you've got this nice correct histogram signal and stack again and you'll see how different the controls are to move around and how different the quality of the detail is. You'll go, oh, this looks a lot more detailed or this is a lot easier than stacking those really noisy high gain shots. So what you do after doing this with six seconds is, you guessed it, you go to like 12 seconds and drop the gain. So you still get a histogram that looks kind of like this, the correct signal, rising off of there, dropping to there. But again, you'd try stacking and you'd say it'd be even less noise because less gain and because of the longer exposure time, more detail. And what will happen is you'll find a point where you start to recognise that your particular camera on that particular scope you're using is best for your taste to be maybe 20 second exposures at whatever gain gives you the signal down here in the histogram. And you go, from now on, you know what, I'm just going to keep shooting at that. But then you'll go to a different target, or maybe the globulars, and you'll find some different conditions. All of it, all of that testing, all of that trial and testing that you're doing by changing the gain and the exposure to always give you this signal that stacks very well, you start to get a consistency of image and you start to get to learn, aha, on different objects you kind of get to know by experience what the best settings are to choose and that helps you in the future that's why I'm saying pick those biggest six brightest biggest nebs and globs for your area and just concentrate on those for at least three months trying all those different gains and expo exposure times it's a really cool thing to do okay because you really learn how it all works. Okay, so now we've learnt how it's just a matter of controlling exposure and gain and looking for the histogram special signal that I've told you. And you've actually seen that the noise when you drop the gain is greatly reduced, even though we've now, I think, trebled the exposure time. The noise is really, really reduced by using this lower gain. And you know how to get the image ready for stacking. As I said though, I can't really show you live stacking simply because terrible conditions. But I'll show you how to do this with some saved images. Let me just close my camera. I'll unplug it. And I'll go to the camera folder option. So what I've done is when I last live stacked out there I, with my Canon DSLR by the way rather than my ZWO camera, it's the same end effect I stacked and saved each individual frame that was used in the stack. I saved them off to an archive directory that was named appropriately and for this demo I've grabbed those images and copied them into the folder that this camera, that this software has been set up to monitor. So I'm using the folder monitor camera, camera option and I can replay it all and try it out. Don't worry about looking at the image please. Over here what I want you to concentrate on, the camera controls now changes to a source folder. You browse to the folder where you saved those and you click on the first file and it loads them all in for you. It recognises what type of file it is. In this case, it was TIFF files by that extension. And loads them all in. You can see one out of ten frames of that um, particular object. And it gives you these VCR buttons. And the one I'm going to use for this is this one. Step forward one frame at a time. Okay? The reason why will become apparent shortly. We're going to do some live stacks. But I also want to show you the next thing you need to do whenever you're using SharpCap and you start to do your imaging. The current frame, it says, is M83, 
which is the object name. Because it was a DSLR, it uses ISO rather than gain, and it's called this shot, or I've called this shot, I for ISO 1600, which is a gain setting. If I were using my ZWO, I'd have something like G340, something like that there, for the gain. But after that, I've got S60 for seconds, 60. These are 60 seconds. These are one minute frames. Because it's a DSLR, it works the best for me with 60 second frames. With my ZWO, that'd be like S20, like 20 seconds. The next word frame means this frame or sorry, this image was purely to frame. I'd been moving the thing around all over the place and originally it was down here and I used the arrow keys to get it up to this position just because I liked that kind of wide field view. It's like a rule of thirds. There's a line vertical at one third. Here's the second third. It always seems to make things appear more interesting to me. You look around and go, wow, and then it draws your eyes to, in this case, a galaxy. Now, I'm shooting a galaxy because I've been doing this for seven years with all sorts of cameras. As a beginner, you, this should be your one of six bright nebs or globs, right? Okay. But it says also the next frame. And the next frame has the same naming convention, in, in but it has this X9 at the end. That means I've stack, I was going to stack nine shots. With my ZWO, I usually just put X. Because it's so fast, at just 20 second frames, I often let 50 build. It really doesn't bother me too much. So I just put X there. You could do the same if you're shooting DSLRs. But from this, I know I should not really stack that first frame. The one I really want to start stacking from is this. This is just my framing shot. So I'm ready to start stacking now. So I come over here and click Live Stack. And don't worry about all of the windows and stuff. All you need to click on is Histogram. And as per that workflow, let me just go back down there and show you. First thing I do is reset it. Once I select the Histogram, let's do that. Reset is right there for the histogram and down here for the color balance. Next, I said make sure the align checkbox is on. It only becomes active, you can see it's kind of hidden there, it only becomes active once the second frame is stacked. But you check it now because you can see it's, while, while I can't actually press anything, I can see it's actually checked. If it wasn't, I would get very, I'd pause and hover over it right now because when the second frame came in from the camera automatically after 60 seconds or with my ZWO after just 20 seconds, I want to be pretty quick with the ZWO to click align frames because what that does is it aligns each star in this image on top of every star in all of the frames and that yields very sharp stars because no matter how good your mount they always have little aberrations and it drifts ever so slightly so say I was stacking with my ZWO 50 frames if I looked at the first image this star right here at the end of the mouse might be there at the start of the frame and on the 50th frame it could be just a tad over to the right and that would mean if I did not align the frames, everything would be streaky. Everything would have blur of about that dimension between the first and 50th frame would be a streak for the star. And naturally all of the detail in the object would be blurred as well. Whereas by aligning the frames, when the second frame comes in, it kind of, you imagine it being a transparency that you'd overlay over this first image and align each star bang on top of the one underneath. And right to th through to the 50th frame, every one of them is kind of like a transparency where every star is perfectly overlined. So you get a, a very bright single spot for the star with good detail. That's why you must always check this. And when the second frame comes in, if that wasn't checked for whatever reason, make sure you check it so that it does align the frames, okay? 
The last thing we have to look for is the status of this stack stacked or dropped. It's over here. And if I hide it using that button there, auto hide, it shows me down here as well how many frames it's processed and how many it's dropped. And you look for the odd one may drop, but after it drops, it continues then to stack correctly. That one in a blue moon dropped frame is usually heat haze or something like that. And if it continually drops, it means there's a cloud over your image where you're imaging, stop imaging and move to another object. Okay, so next is nothing more than to actually start stacking. So 20 seconds later, if I was shooting with a ZWA, 60 seconds in the case of my DSLR, the next frame would come in, I step forward, and over here it should go and say, stacked one, and there we go. Now this is ready, and did I say the second frame? I meant the first frame that was stacked. So now that it's got the first frame to actually stack, you can check. See what I mean? If that was unchecked, I'd immediately check it ready for the second frame to come in. So now we do what is the third frame, which is really the second we're going to stack. And here it comes. Boom. And now you can see something interesting. The histogram, when it does this, it means it's kind of processing and this it's seeing a lot of noise in these images. But as soon as I get to about the third or the fourth uh, stacked frame, I'll go to four frames. Here we go. So there's four frames stacked. It starts to get nice and sharp. You can still see fuzzy here and fuzzy here. That's just as it's handling the noise. But even at this fourth frame, you can start adjusting this histogram. So now we reach the reason why I'm so insistent that back when you're setting up your first image, you never ever adjust it using the auto stretch or this grab handle on the thing. You always leave it in that reset mode. Now it is going to display a different histogram here, which is actually a reflection of the stacking histogram when you're stacking. But if you're not stacking and you're using this to try and set up the image, so the white curve comes off the axis here and finishes about there, so you can start stacking. When you're doing that, always reset it. Why? The answer is, if you adjust this, then the auto stretch here in the, in the um, stacking histogram and the auto colorations down here, for me, maybe it's just my setup on my system, but for me, they go kind of nuts. It's very tough to get an accurate auto color balance or an auto stretch and then only have to move a couple of things if I've done an adjustment over here. That's why I'm, I much prefer to have this reset so it's, it's just got no stretches applied to it at all. I just use that to find that correct signal and start stacking because it enables me to do the following. Remember this is just four minutes worth of exposures now, four stacked shots. If I click this auto color balance and I'll t do a time down. There's two of them. One is auto balance based on stars. And when you've got a lot of stars in the image, that's a good thing. The next one is auto color balance from the histogram peaks. That's usually if you've got nothing but nebulosity. And I mean the whole image covered by nebulosity. But you can flip between the two uh, if you wanted to try it out. But for me, for that image with lots of stars, I'm going to press this auto color balance. So you stay watching the image up here, which I think has, I'm, I'm a bit colorblind. I think that's a green hue. I don't think it's gray. So I'm going to press the star color balance in three seconds. So watch that image. Three, two, one, I've pressed it. And yeah, I can see from my eyes it's done a good job because I can see this is a very nice white star and I'm pretty sure these are red stars here and what I'm seeing here looks kind of blue I can see the amp glow this is an unmodified 
an uncooled Canon DSLR that cost me $200 second hand. So yeah, great, bang, it works straight away. Next we'll do the histogram adjustment. And by the way, if you have to use these manually, it's up to you what you adjust and how the image looks. Because remember, it's just yours. It's like you are painting a bit of art. I don't care what you do, it's your interpretation and how you move these sliders around. But for me, I like to have pretty accurate colours so that I can, with my colour blindness especially, see what's going on and marvel at what's, what I'm actually seeing. Next, the auto adjustment of the histogram. Watch this. Boom. Now it looks extremely bright and it always does this with these shots, but I'll explain how to simply fix it. Down below it's got a black level slider, a mid-level slider and a white level slider. And for me it always does this yellow curve where the mid-level has pushed that intensity of brightness, which is what I'm seeing here, it pushes it too high. So I always grab this mid-level slider first and start moving it to the right to decrease. Look at, look at the image changing. I go as far that it's still a pretty bright mid-tones with still a bit of grey in the background. At that point, I usually zoom in to see stuff around the object. And the reason why is I'm about to adjust the black level. And what the black level does is it concentrates on all the really dark stuff in this image. And the aim is to make the space between the stars as dark as I can get, but at the same time without destroying any of the dark dust lanes in the nebula. So I want to, or in this case, galaxy. So now I take it off auto zoom and zoom in maybe 50%. Okay, and I'm going to just center that and go up a bit with it so I can see. Okay, so now I start raising the black point to darken the space between the stars. At the same time, I'm watching things around these faint galaxy arms. I don't want to lose too much of that sort of the star arms, which are very faint. So I go up with the black point and I'm watching those two things, the darkness of the space as well as making sure I don't blow away too much of the detail. It's causing, it's called clip, clipping data around those faint galaxy arms. Yeah, it's probably good enough. The white level, should I have to adjust it, looks after the white stuff. It makes everything white really bright. And you've got to be careful with, especially nebulas, that you don't start blurring and bloating some of the really bright nebulosity. For this image, I'm quite happy with the white point. I'm not going to worry about it. And I'm starting to see now that that's actually not a bad image. I might go a little bit darker with the mid-tones, which is all this mid-bright stuff, and raise the black point just a tad more, trying not to destroy anything that's probably going to do and to pop to make these colors pop a little bit I'm going to raise this which is actually saturation easy to tell this adjusts the redness in the image the greenness the blue which was all auto adjusted by that for me but this is saturation so if I blow that up by pushing it up it makes the colors pop just a little bit more. So I watch and, and that's good enough. So what is this showing me? This is where this is pretty cool for doing EAA, which is, after all is about observing. And because it's observing, I'm actually going to make the space around that look a bit less black. I don't mind a bit of gray around the object because I'm observing. Here we go. And I'm trying to see the faint detail. So I'm marveling now at just how far the stars go out 
from that galaxy, which I had clipped before by pushing the black point too far in. And by clipping, hopefully on your while you're watching this, you can see the very faint glow of the stars all around the edge of that thing. If I raise the black point too much, you can see that outer edge just sinking away. That's clipping data. I've still got data back at this point here. I can see it's just taking it away, maybe a fraction more at that point. So there you go. I can see just how amazingly far the very faint bits of the, these are stars and the black areas in here are dust. You can see the blue and pink starburst where stars are being born and the red hot, sorry, the red cool stars and the blue hot stars are within these galaxy arms as well as some big bright ones here. This is probably a star in the foreground. But isn't that amazing? And now if I zoom out, auto, and I hide this, auto hide, I auto hide that, there we go. So there's my image, just four frames, 60 second frames. And that's the sort of thing that you need to practice. Watch the video a few times, make your own notes, and you may want to, while you're watching, take a copy of that. And as I say, there you go. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool, and it has got lots of other options within its many menus and settings. But like I said, don't get sucked into trying those. At first, your job is to pick those six really good, big, bright nebulas, big, bright globs, and just start practicing with what I've just shown you here. Thanks very much for watching. Cheers.